Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. 10% of U.S. counties grew primarily because of immigration. And that's for the fiscal year that ended June of last year. Why do you care? Well, the result is a country that's becoming increasingly dependent on immigrants to fill jobs and fund programs like Social Security and Medicare, according to economists. This is as reported by the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday, April 18th. This ultimately affects a couple of other things that you need to be keeping in mind. Uh, aside from Social Security and Medicare, which are dependent on a stable, at least stable population, which we don't have at the moment, this makes sure that we have access to those programs because they're dependent on the people currently paying into the system. And that's how the whole thing's set up. Uh, so when you have too, too few people paying in, then you have a balance issue on the backside, not being able to fund it without borrowing more money, increasing the federal debt. Obviously, the other reason this is relevant is the immigration debate is one that just continues uh, despite Lance and I's best efforts to get everybody well-educated about this. And so we're going to try again today, right? Uh, new story. This is Above the fold, front page of the Wall Street Journal. So we're trying to use a respectable, although typically slightly conservative-leaning editorial board of a paper um, to bring you this. Since, I mean, we didn't tell them to report on this, Lance, did we? I don't. Um, no, I did not send them anything. Okay. I think they're just listening to us and getting story ideas. Got it. Uh, well, this is this is what we're looking at today. Um One, it's not just the coasts. We're going to talk a little bit about Puerto Rico and how it plays into this, uh, because you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with anything? Um, And then the fertility issue, Social Security, and the implications of this. Separate federal statistics released last year suggested that a number of women who put off having babies after the 2007 to 2009 recession are foregoing them altogether now. The general fertility rate in 2017 for women ages 15 to 44 was 60.2 births per 1,000 women, the lowest since the government began tracking it more than a century ago. Okay, so just how bad is it? Well, the general fertility rate is the lowest since the government started tracking it a century ago. Well, you can't have a bad economy. You can't have people coming of age when they're going to think about having children in a bad economy and then after a few years of a good economy, all of a sudden expecting them to have children because they've already gotten into a pattern where they've spent their money on themselves and been tight with it and now they have some extra and they want to have some fun themselves and not have to spend money rearing children. So, of course, and I'm referring you know, to the recession in 2007, 2008. And if you were brought up during that time, that's very influential on your upbringing and on the way you look at whether or not you want to bring children in the world, particularly when you look at, you know, to how hateful the world is right now, at least in American politics and with terrorist groups. And we've been fighting a war in the Middle East and go on and on and on. There aren't too many signs out there that say, hey, why don't you bring children into the world? This is a great place for young people. And the next thing is entitlement programs might fail, right? So now now, even if you are going to work your butt off your whole life and you pay into these systems, they might not be there for you. I hope they realize that. I don't know. I talk to a lot of people that are in their early 20s, mid 20s, and very few of them understand that. They think, oh, well, it's always been here, so it'll always be here. It's like, no, it started during the Great Depression, and it can be taken away at any time. No, they can't do that. I'm like, yeah, they can. You mean, Lance, just like we haven't always had an income tax, that for over a 100 years of our nation's history that people weren't taxed on their income? That's exactly right. Whoa. These are crazy things, learning stuff today. A little bit right? harder to get the income tax out, right? Though. Yeah. 
uh, due to the fact that it's one of the uh, amendments to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But it can be taken out because that too has happened. No way. You can actually put something in the Constitution and take it out? Indeed you can. Yes, you may. <laughs> These are all possibilities. Um, and I mentioned before, you know, this isn't just the coast. And the article explains that this is also the case for counties that contain Philadelphia, Cincinnati, and Dayton, which is in Ohio, by the way, Buffalo, New York, Albuquerque, Nashville, and Burlington, Vermont. It includes suburban counties around New York City, Detroit, Washington, D.C., and St. Louis. And it encompasses scattered rural communities, especially in the Midwest. These are the types of communities relying now on immigration to grow their population. Some of the very counties, mind you, right, that sent a president who, and I don't mean this in a... um like an accusational way or a bad way, it's not supposed to have a slant. It just, I think people would agree, is generally not a pro-immigrant president, typically. I don't think that's what you— Well, that's what I mean. Is that what, what he would did come say, to mind? Yes. Um, he is if you're not a person of color and you have a skill that's needed for the country and you can make us money. Isn't that what he said? Way back, you have to in, come here legally, and we like people from was it Denmark? Yes, okay, mostly white Anglo Saxon Protestant nations, European, yes, or Eurasia countries, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Yeah, okay, he's for that kind of immigration. Gotcha, the rest of it he doesn't really care for. Okay, so not necessarily anti immigrant, anti, anti Mexico immigrant, right? But you know, I, I heard our. Producer in there say, legal, legal. Okay, but legal has laws, and there are mm. only a limited number. And so what you do is you force people to – people don't come here wanting to be illegal, but the government turns them away and says, sorry, we've already met our quota. We met our, so, you know, I um, wonder what would have happened if our founding fathers would have looked – you know, or if the, the Indians, Native Americans – whatever you want to refer to them, the indigenous people to North America would have looked at us and said, sorry, our quotas of people coming across the ocean is full. You're not allowed to be here. Well, I think that they, they, I mean, they kind of tried. Well, it was and too late. Just, yeah. yeah. And we just said no. <laughs> or the fact that, gee, this country grew and is based upon immigrants. Mm. So now all of a sudden let's turn, as you're pointing out today, that our economy is being hurt by the lack of immigrants coming into the country. The you know, immigrants won't come here. People won't come here to work if there are no jobs. Right. All these people that are scared of immigration and want to say they're taking our jobs. No, they're only coming here because jobs are available. If there are no jobs here, they're not coming. They're, they're not hurting the workforce. They never have. Well, and that's, because, I mean, we've, we've said, right, that that's what the data tells us. And the data, in case you're wondering where this is coming from, maybe, maybe you're distrusting of the Wall Street Journal. And that's okay. You can be. It comes from the Center for Health Statistics. Uh, so, you know, you're welcome to, I, I, again, so much of this, it's not a gotcha, okay? It's not a gotcha to anybody. It just, it is what it is. Our government, okay, continually releases data. That indicates to us, and when I say us, I mean Lance and I, and what I would hope would be anybody else who can look at the data, the following points. We have typically net negative immigration. We need immigrants because we are not having enough children, okay? And typically speaking, on average, immigrants, both legal and illegal, are less violent than native-born Americans. Yeah, we did that show Those, a, few, a few months back. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we've done it a few times. And I've tried to reiterate it to people, not because, again, not because it's a gotcha, but because, and you... It's based on data that our government has produced. Actually, you know, we've talked about before, because um, I always say, you know, you correct me if I'm wrong, Lance, but in this case, it's no 
secret that Lance is not a big fan of our current president. So we'll let somebody who I would say is probably more a fan of the current president tell me if there's anything wrong with this statement. As I understand it, our president's current objection to immigration, right, is that they are violent criminals and that they steal American jobs. Is that a fair... That those are the That's, main those those are the two basic ones. Yes, I I would I would say so. From the very very little that I watch slash read slash listen to about politics, I would I would agree with that. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm asking because I mean you've retweeted stuff that the president has said. So no, no, no. I I get okay. it. I get it. Yeah. And this is Caleb, by the way. For yeah, if you're I, a new listener and and you don't know that our producer's name is Caleb. Um. So then the next question would be. The data from the government that the president heads up tells us that they are not violent criminals. In fact, they are less violent than native-born Americans and that they're important to the economy, legal and illegal, and that they don't take American jobs. They take the jobs that Americans won't take, which is what keeps food prices low and other prices. I mean, it's not just food, but all manner of prices, products that we buy all the time that we take for granted. The reason those prices are low is because these are people who have come here who aren't subject to our labor laws. And so they get paid what to Americans would be a disgustingly low amount, you know, something that we're not willing to work for. So again, the two main concerns, as we're saying, we've acknowledged them are that they are violent criminals and the other one being that they will steal American jobs. And I guess the third one, the recent one being our country's full. I mean, that was a quote. So I don't think we have to ask if that's a correct state. I mean, he, our president said that the country's full. We have no more room. Um, and again, we have a declining native born population. So again, and this is where I ask our producer, I don't understand where there's any interpretation of those facts that support the agenda of immigration is this big problem that, you know, we, we have to, for example, we have to build a wall to solve. Why? Where is the data telling us that this is a big problem that has to be addressed? So it, it's like what we were talking about pre-show when we were talking about technology and I thought of the good points of it and Lance would talk to the bad and while while we said that there was a lot of good stuff, there's always the select few that could use it for the bad stuff. And so I think I think that's the case here is there's always there's always a select few. I think I think Trump's targeting the select few in this case. The, the worst few, of the worst. The select few that will not pay their taxes, that will hide from all the regulations that you pay as a working taxpayer. And that Lance pays as a retired, still working taxpayer, the people that will earn a salary and will vote but do not pay taxes and do not give to the economy. I think he's focusing more on those people than the ones that are, yes, here illegally but still doing everything right. So in this situation, just just let me let me make sure I understand. We talked about technology before the show, a pre-show discussion, and what Caleb was getting at is he tends to look at the positives of technology. He, In other words, he believes the benefits outweigh the negatives. Um, and I think in this situation, what you're telling me is that in this case, it's the opposite. We believe the positives outweigh the negatives, while the others believe that the few people who are bad, and admittedly, there are some very bad people here who are not here legally, uh, that outweighs the positive benefit of immigration. In in most cases, yes. I do see where you're coming from, though, with the, oh, my generation's not having babies, so you have to sustain the population somehow, and that's how this is. I get that. I'm not going to argue that, but when it when it comes to what you're asking me about where Trump stands, I think that's where it is, is he's looking at these bad people. They're well, the the very even though they are very few, they are still able to cripple a country if they are so allowed to. Okay, uh, and and I what what I mean by okay is I understand what you're saying 
how you think the president's viewing this. Let's talk about how you view it real quick. Are you of that same mind or does the data tell you something different? Maybe some, I mean, it doesn't, it's not an either or it's not like it has to be what Lance and I have tried to share with people or what the president, I mean, there are other interpretations of this too than just these two items. Um, so, oh, and the other thing I just want to throw in there while we're on this Lance, because we've talked about the Coast Guard before as well, right? That the vast majority of illegal substance and sex trafficking often comes by sea, not by land. Um, and that's not an immigration thing. That's just a, and that's the other thing. I really dislike that we always mix immigration and border control as the same thing because border control is a much bigger topic than just immigration. It's not just about stopping illegal immigration. There's all sorts of border control issues that don't have anything to do with a person crossing the border. It has everything to do with the product or item crossing the border. Okay. And that's not just Mexico. That's also Canada and any other nation in the world. All of our ports of entry have a border control uh, role to play to make sure that we are accurately paying attention to what's coming in to the country and leaving the country. So I wanted to throw that in before I said, are, in other words, are you fully on board with the president's position on this, despite some of this other information? Uh, it's a it's a tough it's a tough answer, because on on one side, you have to c- account for the country as a whole and what even a select few people can do to hurt the country. But on the other side, you can't ignore data. I mean, if the numbers are there, you have to. Look at them. You can't. You don't have to. Well, you can't. (laughs) It's 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 smart to. It's smart to because it's because it's there. Mm. You can't refute science. You can't refute numbers typically. So you can't just slap a fake news label onto the numbers that you're giving me just because I don't agree with them. Mm. Okay. So I so I get I get the numbers. I agree with the numbers, and I get what you're saying. But also, you have to. I where I where it is for me is I still I side with Trump just because I think that the country can be destroyed by these people. That's does that make sense? It makes at all. No, that's, that's no, a very, because it's a there's nothing answer. But yes. OK, I, but, but I, you I say, say but you, I'm sorry. I let you face. <laughs> no, I, I'm done. I'm done. It's there. there's what I have. The problem with is you said you look at the numbers and you don't dis. Regard the numbers. What's in the numbers that says immigrants destroy the country? They don't commit as many crimes as native born people and they benefit the economy. So what is it that they do that, that runs the risk of destroying the country? Where are the numbers that show their actions in any way destroy the country? It's the fact a- that they're untraceable. Any that's, mo- that's a- the thing. Any more so. Because this is the key, okay? It's not – the people who say immigrants don't do bad things, that's not true. Just like it's not true to say that native-born Americans don't do bad things. The point is that on the average, they are less likely to do bad things than we are uh, in our own country. Um, right, but when – So it, they're no more – in other words, they're less of a risk than the people like the three of us in this room who were born here. They're less of a risk. So how does it make sense then to to say, well, we have to control them? Don't we have to control Cause, ourselves cause, before we control? Yes, but if you if you went out and you robbed a bank, and we know that you robbed a bank, we know that it's you one hundred percent. We can send the police on you. We know where you live. We have your tax records. We have all this information. We have the facial recognition scanners that we were just talking about in the in the Barkley Park. We have all this stuff that we can use to find you and to put you in prison. With an illegal immigrant, we can't – we don't have that. We don't have your tax records. We don't have proof of residence. We don't know where you are. You could be anywhere in the country or you could be out of the country. That's what makes them more dangerous is not – Well, it doesn't make them more dangerous. It makes them more difficult to capture if they do something wrong. How does that bring down the country? How does that, in your words, destroy the country? Because you can't catch them. That's the thing. They can do okay. it and get away okay. with it for okay. years. Okay. Well, here's your challenge then. I Because maybe there's something to what you're getting at. We need some data on that. We need some data that supports that it's significantly more difficult to 
track down an illegal immigrant who's committed a crime than a native born citizen. But again, still, that's just one. And that's to me. Okay. It isn't that there aren't negative effects of these things because that's where I think we, we always go wrong. And I, when I say we on the national level, the media always goes wrong with this. It's an either or right. Immigration is all good or it's all bad. And it can only be that. And it's like, nah, it's nothing is ever, I mean, rarely is anything ever all good or all bad. It's almost always a blend. And oftentimes it leans one more, one, it leans more one way than the other. And I think this is a case where, again, at least the data that we have that we've shared with people seems to clearly indicate that it leans one way that it, the positives outweigh the negatives. But that's why we have these conversations and Lance. We're going to continue our discussion here, but before we do, tell us a little bit about what we're trying to do with this discussion. Well, we try to have these discussions because we're attempting to educate people and provide them with honest, open conversations and respectful most of the time. <laughs> you threw that one in there. I did. Begrudgingly. Today. I did today. Okay. Yes. Begrudgingly. Got it. But I still got through it. You did. You did. We'll see if you can make it through the rest of the show today, and we'll be right back. Immigrants propel the population. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. Thursday, April 18th, 2019, 10% of U.S. counties grew primarily because of immigration in the fiscal year ending in June of last year. 10%. And that includes a lot of counties throughout the Midwest. In fact, a big portion of the country that voted for the president, who we have identified as typically not having a very favorable regard for immigration. Uh, and we've been talking with our producer some more today, uh, Lance as well, to try to get some perspective on this. Let's talk about long-term issues, though, with a declining population, Lance. Uh, Social Security and Medicare. A mm -hmm. couple of our biggest budget expenditures, yes? Right, because despite back the, Despite the common belief that a third of Americans believe – that foreign aid is our number one expenditure, when in fact it's uh, less than 1% of the budget. Uh, no, it's taking care of our older population. Well, because the government back in the 80s, and I'm putting air quotes around this, balanced the budget by taking the surplus of Social Security that was being paid into the system by the baby boomers at that time who were making good money. And now that it's time for the baby boomers and they've been retiring, there is not the population in the United States that is working to fund it. So the money was there and the government spent it back in the 80s. And now while it's coming, when it's coming due, Social Security, for example, when it's coming due, it's not there. So these baby boomers didn't not pay their way. They paid their way. But now the money was spent before they had to be paid off because the government, you know, always puts, seems like they always put problems off until later. Well, now it's coming due. And with fewer people working in the country with the population down and the economy not as good, now there aren't as many people paying into Social Security, which is taxing the system in order to whether or not it can even survive and keep and stay around. Quote, the bottom line is that it would take a ridiculous level of immigration to come close to maintaining even the current ratio of workers to non-workers, said Stephen Camerto, demographer and director of research at the Center for Immigration Studies. Quote, immigration isn't going to fix social, social security, end quote. So a little counter to what we're saying. And I've, I'll certainly, I mean, see that, you know, when you look at the numbers, which they're staggering, by the way, of our shortfalls and projected shortfalls, it's not as simple as just saying, well, we'll just let a bunch of people in and that'll fix it. No, because as Lance identified, we long ago broke the system by stealing from the system. Uh, so it takes more than just, well, if we let all these people in, then everything will be fine. Um, it's not quite that simple, okay, because – if more people become entitled to Social Security, the problem will just come up again. It's another, it's another one of those band-aids. They wanted to balance the budget, so they stole from the system. Now the, now the answer is, well, if we just have more people, then everything will be fine. Well, it'll be fine until they retire, and then we have the same problem again. So 
the whole point in all of this is, you know, we can't rob one to save the other. But at the same time, long term, we have to either be maintaining or increasing our population to be able to maintain the system as it is currently structured. The whole problem that I've had, Lance, with the Social Security and Medicare systems from ever since I was old enough to understand is this whole idea that basically it's a it's not you pay into it and the government setting your money aside. It's you pay into it and that's taking care of the people that are currently being that are currently retired right now and drawing from the system. So well, it was right until the government spent and, it until they broke back it. in the 80s. Right. Yeah, that, that was exactly how the system <laughs> was was set up to work, how it should work. Um, because then, right, we know there's enough money. The system is always balanced because all it is is essentially a glorified savings account, right? I mean, is we're going to take this portion and someday you'll get it back. Uh, and, and there's no, you might get it back. It's no, your money's there. It's just, we have it set aside for you. Uh, and now we don't have that, uh, because now it relies on people like myself to take care of those who are currently drawing those checks. And the issue with this type of setup is exactly what we see now. When there's changes, in, when the population fluctuates, which it inevitably will do up and down, it causes rifts in the system that equal gigantic deficits in some cases. So that's that's from a social security standpoint. What about from a fertility standpoint? We've talked a little bit about this before, Lance, but never super specifically. Is it bad that millennials... Are ha- that on average have had significantly less children than generations before? And is it bad that Gen Z, which is Caleb's generation, uh, might be similar to that? I mean, is it because we've talked there's there's going to be a food shortage, right? If the population worldwide continues to grow the way it is. So is it really bad that there's going to be some less a few less people? Well, it depends on what your goal is. If I'm you asking want, you. If you want a strong economy for the United States, then yes, it's a negative. Okay. If you're have a worldview and you don't care about how the United States does. And then as I like to call them, you know, you're concerned about first world problems. And that is, is there going to be enough food later? Is there enough, you know, are we damaging the ozone layer? Uh, Those are first world problems. Because if you live in a third world country, your number one problem every day is finding enough food to eat, to stay alive, Mm. getting medicine. So, but if you are lucky enough to live in a country where you don't have those problems, then you can count this as, you know, you can be holier than thou and say, well, I'm not going to have children because that way there won't be as many people here on earth and we won't, I won't leave as big a, my family won't leave as big a carbon footprint. We won't do this. We won't do that. And that's wonderful. Except in these struggling countries, those people are having babies because that's how you get enough workers to make enough money to get enough food. It's why here in the Midwest, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, farm families had 10, 12 children. They had children basically every year that mom could give birth because it took that many laborers to make enough money to feed the family and for everybody to stay alive. And that was their goal. So they kind of had, in other words, they had they had their own social security system and still do in first world countries. If you have more children, then when you get old and can't work, they take care of you. In, well, that's the way the, the government. That's the way the system should work. But now we have the government who steps in uh-huh. and takes care of. People. So, so what do you think? I mean, you're somebody asks you, right, Lance? I want your advice. We're thinking about having kids, and we want to take into account this trend, which is people are having less kids. Is that a, is it a good thing or a bad thing from your personal perspective? I don't think you need to have children. We just need to open up the borders to get people in here who want to work. Okay. There are enough people in the world to supply our labor shortage. So you don't so have to have, de- so you don't have to have children yourself. Declining, declining, a declining sh- birth rate. Right. Is not ne- doesn't necessarily, necessarily lead to a bad economy. If you open up the borders, which the United States has done in the past mm-hmm. during world war two, we opened up the borders and we allowed thousands, tens of thousands of people from Mexico into the United States to work so that we could win the war. And then 
when all the soldiers returned, the millions of soldiers returned home and jobs were scarce, which there were, people forget about that. But for the first four or five years after World War II, it was a very difficult time economically in the United States. And I'm not making this up and I'm not trying to be a racist, but the government started in the early 50s a program called Operation Wetback to round up all the people that we had brought from Mexico said, please come over here and help us build stuff so we can win the war. We rounded them up and sent them back to Mexico because we used them for what we needed them for because that was when the baby boomers were coming and we had plenty. We didn't have enough jobs and we had too many returning soldiers who needed a job, which is also when the GI Bill was created, which I know your brother is looking, you know, with that and all those kind of things because it's like, well, gee, we can't bring all these soldiers back in and find them jobs. So, hey, we'll pay for their schooling because that way that will keep them busy and then they can slowly come into the workforce over the next four to six years. And so we don't have to take all of these people back immediately after the war and find them a job because, oh, remember, we were in a depression, an extended time that we call the Great Depression when we go to the war. So, I mean, there are all kinds of ways to solve the problem. And I, so it's, I'm all for if people should have children because they want to have children. Okay. There shouldn't be government regulations on why you should or shouldn't. However, I would also say we need to find a way to get more workers in the United States if we want to continue to grow the economy. And the two ways to do that, right, are either we increase the rate of births from current citizens or we allow more people into work. I mean, those, those are the only ways to increase the amount of workers, right? Or, or we figure well, out how to get people who are retired to come back and work more. Mm-hmm. We could do that too. Right. You also, Am I missing? No, those, that's it. Those I mean, are the three. Yeah, because you raise the, you know. The, get people who aren't working to work because mm-hmm. that encompasses retired and otherwise. Mm-hmm. Get more births from natural born citizens mm-hmm. or well, just citizens because if you're, you know, if you're born to a U.S. citizen, you are a U.S. citizen kind of thing or let more immigrants into the country Mm -hmm. are the three ways that we could increase the working population, which we have to do if we want to stay economic, if we want to keep growing economically. Yes. Because we've identified another foreign concern is that in five to 10 years, unless we pick up our current rate of growth, China will surpass us as the number one economical power. Mm -hmm. That is a reality, not a maybe. It's going to if we don't grow faster. Economically, again, there might be ways to grow economically faster that don't have to include increasing the population. But we know increasing the population typically correlates to also being able to grow the economy. More people spending money, more people working, more people owning their own business. That equals a more robust economy. That is correct. Okay, got it. So, Lance, we challenge people to tune in to the show, bring new listeners to the show. And there's a lot of different ways that you could refer somebody to listen. What are a few of those? My personal favorite, Spotify. There's Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and any place else that fine podcasts are found. And we want your engagement with this show. We want to know your thoughts. I mean, that's part of why I asked Caleb today is, as I've said before, Lance and I are just two minds. Uh, We're doing the best we can. And that means that people also have to include uh, others in the conversation at TrueChat.org, Facebook, Twitter, and otherwise, at TrueChat.org on social media. Let us know your thoughts. To end this on a good note, Lance and I do agree on something. We both agree on Spotify being our favorite of the platforms. (laughs) How about that? (laughs) Okay. Look at that. That is not what I was expecting, but (laughs) we'll take it, right? Look at that. Finding the common ground. Yeah. There's, there's always, there's always some common ground somewhere. You just got to find it. That's, that should be the new quote for the studio. There's always some common ground somewhere. You just got to find it. Okay. That could be the new mission statement. Uh, so make sure to give us your feedback. We it's want it. It's five o'clock somewhere. Bring it, yeah, it's five, it's that's five kinda, o'clock That's kind of my, my, what I'm feeling. Uh, okay. You know, that's kind of my feeling about things. Uh, for the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. <laughs>